much, uh, Wendy, for that, uh, for that wonderful introduction to the topic as well as to my career and um, for your hospitality in inviting me here to take part in this workshop. I've read work by a number of you but never had the chance to meet most of you, so I am really looking forward to the discussions over the next day and a half. I have an epigraph to my paper taken from a Canadian poet, Roy Mickey, from a recent collection called In Flux. Mickey writes, even though a poetic act may not appear to make much happen, it remains a potent model of a creative form that attends to the ethical call of otherness. So at a time when commodification threatens to become the dominant mode of relation, what kinds of creative forms can model viable alternatives to the logic of the marketplace? Like Roy Mickey, Charles Bernstein offers poetics, as in his words, the foundation for a realm of value that is neither scientistic nor moralistic, arguing that poetics is the ethical engagement with the shifting conditions of everyday life. So what might such forms of ethical engagement look like in our times and how might they mean? Can literary experimentation escape the influence of scientific modes of experimentation, which are after all the dominant modes for experimentation in our times? Can literature make a difference in the world? If so, how? What kind of difference can it make? If it seems to make no difference within economic, social, or political spheres, then where does its value lie? These are questions asked by my students in every meeting of our class on literature and human rights last term. These students found issues of literary experimentation loomed urgently in their lives as they questioned their decisions to become graduate students in architecture and education as well as in literary studies. Their questions echo debates currently re-energizing the post-colonial field, my home discipline. So today I'll consider these debates in relation to some of the ways a few contemporary literary texts are simultaneously renewing social and aesthetic imaginaries by engaging the troubling dilemmas of their time and place in ways that expand understanding of the capacities of literary experimentation beyond the scientific and moralistic imperatives that dominate so much discussion today. And two elements of the conference call interest me especially. These are questions about the nature of experimental writing and the impact of ends, ends as blockages, possibly conclusions, detours, endings that loop back to new beginnings, and also as goals to be aimed for even if understood as always just beyond our reach. So I'm going to address these two themes together, raising questions about how readers recognize literary experimentation and asking why some texts travel easily across borders while others fail to find the readers they deserve. And I won't be able to answer these questions, but I hope they'll achieve some resonance, um, if not immediately, then through our subsequent discussions over the next few days. So what is an experiment and why is it valued? The rise of experimental forms of scientific inquiry have shaped the biases of our contemporary culture, encouraging a belief that knowledge can be based on the conduct of replicable experiments produced in laboratory settings, which, through excluding extraneous factors, can lead to faith in progress. And the first time I was interviewed by a grants adjudication body for a team grant, I was totally flummoxed when I was asked how I would deal with, um, in distinguishing between dependent and independent variables. It wasn't something that had been part of my literary training. So we're told that properly conducted experiments guarantee the authority of evidence-based decision-making and its superiority to other forms of reasoning and belief. Western science has moved from appealing to the established authority of the Christian church, 
divesting its authority in the logic of this kind of experimentation. With modernism, literature followed suit. The great modernist writers experimented within literary forms and with them, extending their boundaries and mixing conventions, but also asserting the autonomy of literature. Literary experimentation substituted thought experiments of various kinds for test tube or clinical trial experiments, but I'm suggesting the logic was similar. The dominant experimental model privileges the scientist-artist conducting the experiment, who sets the framework through which the experimentation proceeds and decides what is extraneous to the inquiry. This framework privileges the autonomy of the writer and of literature, the idea that the work can separate itself from the context of its production and reception to inhabit the same kind of ideal vacuum as a scientist's test tube experiment. That model was questioned, of course, by post-structuralist and post-colonial theories, yet it continues to influence much thinking today. So literary experimentation is usually, but not always, cast in a positive light. Experimentation makes it new, as Ezra Pound commanded. Australian novelist Patrick White, however, reminds us of the darker side of experimentation. Casting his artist figure in his 1970 novel, The Vivisector, as akin to those 19th century surgeons who conducted their experiments by cutting into the flesh of living animals. For White, the novelist's craft necessitated the cruel practice of dissecting human relations in all their vulnerability. Today, I suggest, the novelist as heroic vivisector may be yielding to images of the writer as archivist, autoethnographer, collector, gatherer, eavesdropper, medium, voyeur, victim of hauntings, and survivor of history. Whatever the specific metaphor invoked, what once seemed an exclusive form of agency now tends to be surrendered to other forces. Authors have survived the proclamation of the death of the author, but in this altered capacity. Authorial intention remains of interest, but only in interaction with what readers make of the texts writers produce. At least I think that's the case in literary criticism. The opposite may hold true in the rest of the world beyond the academy, where there are many who wish to be writers and far few who wish to be readers. The author as celebrity is part of the larger trend toward commodification that many associate with globalizing processes. This is the theme of um, a conference I'll be attending this October at the University of Northampton. I may see some of you again there. It's on narratives of difference in the global marketplace. So some of my thinking today has been influenced by that conference call to think about how difference and diversity are commodified in the production and reception of culture through narrative strategies. More specifically, I'm wondering about the relations between experimentation and commodification. Conventionally, I think we've seen experimentation as resisting commodification. But what worries many today is the growing sense that in fact commodification feeds on experimentation and that experimentation is losing its ability to challenge market logics. The fear today is that any kind of experimentation can be co-opted by such commodifying forces and put to the service of the market, the nation state, or the needs of a particular academic discipline. So capitalism's creativity is vampiric. It feeds on anything living. So I want to think a bit about context for writing and reading today. Wendy's already introduced them much more <coughs> thoroughly. Can literary experimentation offer roots toward forms of understanding beyond commodification? How can readers recognize such potentially enabling forms? Marta Dvorak and I begin our book Crosstalk by asking how do readers negotiate meaning in contexts where norms of understanding diverge? What are the fictions that shape Canadian engagements with the global, and how are they changing? And we suggest that these questions of audience, community, and meaning making require closer attention, which can be considered through the phenomena of what we call crosstalk, 
a metaphor for the complex forms of interference that can both energize and frustrate communication in cross-cultural contexts today. Well, Canadian Cree novelist Thompson Highway's Kiss of the Fur Queen is full of such moments, which can be comic, tragic, or both simultaneously. A misheard prayer is rendered nonsensical. Jokes fall flat. It seems, in the text's words, that a chasm as unbridgeable as hell separates Cree from English. When Jeremiah asks, how do you say university in Cree? His brother Gabriel answers, semen airy. And the text tells us this is the closest he could get in his native tongue, making a playful pun that nonetheless carries the ambivalent taste of the sexual abuse that characterized their stay in the residential school. So the text says that word, seminary, flooded his palate like a surge of honey. With that word honey, the repeated signifier of resurgent trauma and the ambivalent emotions it evokes in different ways in both of the brothers. So I'm wondering, is it helpful to describe Highway's novel as experimental? It documents in English and in recognizable novel form the meaning-making systems of the Cree, their language, beliefs, and myths as understood by Highway and lived by his characters, as well as the gaps between these systems and those afforded by Western belief systems. In its depiction of the residential school system and its legacy, the novel goes further, taking risks, as critic Jennifer Henderson suggests, by posing taboo questions about sexuality, violation, and identity, which take specific forms for residential school survivors, but which also resonate with another context. Henderson lists a few. These are the questions she thinks the text raises for us as readers. Does sexual abuse make you gay? Does cultural dispossession and contamination with Christianity make you First Nations? And First Nations is one of the Canadian political words for uh, indigenous nations in Canada. This novel, like Highway's first play, The Red Sisters, has traveled globally with significant success. Henderson employs George Hagerty's argument that Catholicism has functioned in Gothic fiction as something of a laboratory for the exploration of same-sex desire. And she employs this to partly explain what she sees as Highway's curious deployment of the Gothic trope of Catholicism in Kiss of the Fur Queen. So in this laboratory, the results are ambiguous generating further questions for the book's critics to explore. In further noting that the novel's hybridities are difficult, vexed, and multiple, Henderson concludes that to think of the book as an experiment in bridging cultures and opening new ways of cross-cultural understanding for its readers would be to deny its sexually scandalous nature. She argues that to make it function as the ethical disruption of post-colonial discourse, as I did in an earlier article, would require, she believes, First Nations culture to be clearly and cleanly other to settler culture. So I don't agree with her premise here. I think there room remains for reading this novel's experimentation in cultural terms informed by close colonial critique not to deny the novel's engagement with ambivalent sexualities, but to see these within the frame set up by the novel's epigraphs and its prefatory note on the trickster. And last week I delivered a paper where I asked what it might mean for Canadian readers to shift our gaze from transatlantic imaginaries toward the transpacific, and what it would mean for postcolonial studies in Canada to follow local indigenous initiatives of building connections across the Pacific with Maori and Australian indigenous counterparts. So Henderson is justly wary of employing indigenous texts to revive post-colonial imaginaries. But I see this as a reciprocal dialogue 
The recent scholarly turn in many disciplines, from continental to transoceanic imaginaries, is sparking a new set of questions about the frameworks through which knowledge is produced. We're learning to be more attentive to epistemological pluralism and the importance of situatedness in generating modes of knowing. And here I'm very aware that um, Walter Mignolo cautions against lazy employments of situatedness, arguing that we have to take it a step further to revise Descartes' notion, I think, therefore I am, to the rephrasing, I am where I think. This, he argues, is more than just gesturing to situatedness. Um, it's not the universal situatedness, he argues, but it's about the epistemic and ontological racism of imperial knowledge. So in a similar vein, James Clifford argues that native Pacific conditions are importantly different from those generating North Atlantic cultural studies. If Black Atlantic and South Asian diaspora theory is to travel well in the Pacific, there needs to be a significant adaptation to a different map in history. So Australian Wanyi writer Alexis Wright's novel Carpentaria reveals how that different map in history make their meanings when developed out of indigenous roots in Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. And when I first planned this paper, I wanted to write about this novel. It's one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. Uh, I think it casts a lot of questions for us to think about uh, in terms of literary experimentation, what it means and how it can mean. But unfortunately, because of interest of time, it's almost entirely written out of this paper. But if you haven't read it, I do urge you uh, to look at it. It's an amazing book. Here, though, I, I, I simply say that I think Highway's depiction of the indigenous Canadian North in KISS develops its own map in history as well that is also not readily assimilated into universalist modes of meaning making derived from Eurocentric knowledge formations, nor from Black Atlantic, South Asian, or Pacific imaginaries. So indigenous studies are leading to a revival of interest in the particular dynamics and institutional structures of invader settler colonies around the world. And post-colonial studies is belatedly recognizing the importance of indigenous perspectives. Part of this turn toward indigenous imaginaries involves a revival of interest in the literature and knowledge systems produced by indigenous peoples globally. And that revival of interest, in turn, is leading to questions about how to write and read across cultural differences. These questions about meaning making emerge in the context of sovereignty claims, which remain to be resolved. The literacy required to read aesthetic and sovereignty claims together requires new forms of attention to difference. Norms of understanding that make sense within imperialist imaginaries and their nationalist descendants are being challenged by indigenous fictions that cast old questions about identity and relations in a new light. And I think we need to think about the way in which these fictions problematize Western assumptions about time-space relations, about expression and representation, and claims to knowledge, expertise, and authority, often through pluralizing modes of knowledge, of knowing and belief. So globalization is alerting readers to these contending understandings of time and space. And I choose the figure of the chronotope to signal that different map in history to which Clifford alludes. Bakhtin, you'll remember, describes how the chronotope operates as a formally constituted category of literature and the place where the knots of narrative are tied and untied and where time with a capital T becomes palpable and visible. For Peter Hitchcock, chronotope is not any old coordinate of time and space, but that figural semantic process allowing narrative to proceed to form. And he argues that in every space of post-coloniality, marked by nation or locale, movement or embeddedness, inscription or orality. Culture refracts duration. 
not just that colonialism was endured, but that its figures of time did not absolutely displace or dismantle local forms of temporality. So in the long space, Hitchcock sets himself the challenge of taking chronotope as a constitutive problem of transnational narration, a knot that is a key to the ways through which postcoloniality can be expressed. He does this to intervene in current debates about world literature, postcoloniality, and narrative form. So I'm inspired by his argument, and again I'm quoting him, that transnationalism of this kind seeks to link writers beyond the spatial and epistemological divide, not because their histories are the same, but because they speak to a logic of time that remains dissatisfied with posts or eras or linearity, or representing at best through sociological or anthropological content. So I'm arguing that Highway in Kiss of the Fur Queen and Wright in Carpentaria speak to alternative logics of time-space that work through chronotopes that are formally transformative in just this way. Kiss of the Fur Queen takes as its second epigraph the powerful statement made by Chief Seattle of the Squamish that the dead are not powerless. And it provides the truth of that statement through moments that erupt through the narrative that follows. And I may, um, in the interest of time, skip. You think, you think it's okay? <laughs> okay, well, I'll just say quickly, the prelude um, to champion Jeremiah's birth is marked by the moaning and whispering of the ancestors, including his grandmother's voice among them, despite her death 21 years earlier, shortly after her daughter's marriage to champion Jeremiah's father. When the Okamasis brothers return home from residential school, they hear a lone wolf's howl, touching off a vague shudder that brushed the surface of their hearts in perfect unison, like the ice-cold hand of someone waking after 500 years of sleep. This occurs on the island where Father Thibodeau's men had caught Chachagatu, a woman the brothers are told was evil because she held a frightening dream power. As the narrative progresses, she becomes linked in Dancer Gabriel's mind to the winking white fox who appears at key moments to throw the text realism slightly off balance. And as they learn more about her defiance of the church, the brothers' interest in her grows. Through her power that transcends the grave, Chachagatu testifies to other modes of knowing and forms of authority alternative to the church and school. Carpentaria's narrative also repeatedly shows that the dead can intervene in the lives of the living, among other moments when the ancestors intervene to help normal phantom save his grandson Bala, and when there is a rock which has been waiting centuries for this moment, trips up the mind's employees as they pursue the mind's opponent, Norm's estranged son, Will Phantom. At these moments, time with a capital T becomes both palpable and visible, and narrative knots are tied and untied. Wright explains the temporal logic behind the telling of her text. Wright says, the idea struck me that if I were to tell a story to our people, I would also be telling a story to our ancestors. So that expanded sense of audience, transcending time, necessitated a story, in her words, that was written like a long song, following ancient tradition, reaching back as much as it reached forward, to tell a contemporary story to our ground. So those simple lines issue a challenge to Western assumptions about audience, ground, time, progress, narrative, and value all of which starts with the title of Carpentaria's chapter one, From Time Immemorial. So I am gonna shift here, leaving out a paragraph on some of the debates around globalizations, flows and frictions, and the opportunities for agency that they provide, because I think Wendy's already done a great job talking about um, some of the arguments around globalization. 
Mignolo has identified the cracks now appearing in long dominant imaginaries, opening spaces for decolonial modes of understanding the past and reimagining the future. Boaventura de Souza Santos has argued the need to link what he calls global cognitive justice to global social justice. And I'm arguing that Highway and Wright show how those linkages can be forged through fiction, through fiction that challenges some of the norms around fiction writing today. So cognitive justice challenges the epistemic violence that accompanied colonialism's physical forms of violence and that continues today. Epistemic violence can be enacted through literary experimentation and it can also be challenged by it. Literary critics and writers continue to debate which kinds of literature are best suited to countering colonialism's epistemic violence. Postcolonial criticism and theory has been accused of privileging experimental and postmodern fictions at the expense of literary realism and documentary. Um, you're probably familiar with arguments by Lazarus Moss and many others. For these critics, the postcolonial fondness for experimentation over realism has encouraged complacency about the way things are and diverted attention from issues of social justice in the world around us and from different ways of understanding how literary texts make meaning in different contexts. But postcolonial realism has also been attacked from the opposite angle for encouraging ethnographic readings of texts in search of information retrieval and encouraging readers to treat complex creative texts as merely native informants. These critiques identify worrying trends in some reading practices with realism seen as privileging a salvage mentality, with magic realism becoming a limiting label complicit with imperialism and with other forms of experimentation sometimes falling into traps of exotifying and othering difference. And here Graham Huggins, the postcolonial exotic, is probably the best known example. So those who advocate the autonomy of literature argue postcolonial approaches privilege theme over form, neglecting aesthetic experimentation to impose a grid of reading for nation, class, race, sexual preference and gender on texts that seem to reward such attention and then ignoring others. I'm thinking of Chris Bongi's work here. Those who refuse efforts to separate politics from aesthetics um, argue for more complex attention to the ways they implicate each other. Differences of emphasis do separate these positions but I think at their best, both are advocating the need for more nuanced understanding of the specifically located ways in which post-colonial texts make their meaning. So this takes me to a brief section on the privileged geopolitical spheres of attention. Uh, Wendy Knepper points out that precisely because of its mobilities, intertwined histories and intersecting cultures. The Caribbean is an important testing ground for theories and close readings that explore genres transgressions, unpredictable movements, and creolizing processes. So in the talk so far, I've suggested that indigenous fictions from Canada and Australia can play a similar role. Both Highway and Wright compose fictions that emerge from very particular times and places to set up dialogues with the cultural traditions of many other times and other places. They read the world through Cree and Wani eyes from the respective norths of their two great continents. And the work they have produced looks like experimentation to those of us reading them from other sites. In this concluding section, then, I, I want to turn briefly to the Caribbean to consider briefly how a small island place can function as a testing ground for imagining ways of living without being owned by someone else. 
And that phrase comes from Shani Mutu in her most recent novel, Valmiki's Daughter, from 2008. How to imagine ways of living without being owned by someone else. So in many ways, Valmiki's Daughter takes up a classic 19th century realist problem in its account of characters who live their lives bearing up under the burden of too much knowing, with no release for their unsanctioned desires. Yet their small place exists in a globalizing world where alternative destinies can be imagined, even if it takes considerable courage to make them happen. Within such contexts, the book can be seen as a quietly experimental fiction that pushes the boundaries of what can be imagined within the contours of a small Caribbean place. And I think of it as functioning as a kind of a companion to Thomas Glaze's anthology, Our uh, Caribbean, A Gathering. So in Valmiki's Daughter, a range of characters find themselves trapped within a heterosexist matrix that governs and distorts their relations with one another and their understanding of themselves. Nyan laments the influence of what he calls this small, small place and the way it makes him feel a small man in front of his cosmopolitan French wife, Annique. Valmiki, who as a young man had abandoned his male lover to enter a conventional heterosexual marriage, warns his daughter Vivica, this is a small place. It is not a kind place. This place is too small for you. Take a deep breath and leave this behind. So all three of Mutu's novels can be seen as responses to the challenge of imagining freedom within such a place and the necessity of leaving these places behind if freedom is to be found. Yet her highly experimental first book, Sirius Blooms at Night, has, I think, received much more attention than the two novels that followed. In its direct address to an imagined tourist reader, Valmiki's daughter also seems a deliberate response to Jamaica Kincaid's well-known polemic, A Small Place. Mutu's book begins with a prologue subtitled 24 Seconds, which is revisited in an epilogue subtitled 24 Months. 24 Seconds refers to that specific sliver of time when Valmiki first realized who his daughter really was and when, he now thinks, he might have told her his own story so that she might create a different one. That moment was lost and is now regretted. 24 months refers to how long his daughter Vivica thinks that her marriage of convenience that will take her from the island is likely to last. She and her lover Anik had dreamt of fleeing the island together until Anik's pregnancy made such dreams impossible. Now, Vivica has agreed to marry Trevor who is being pressured by his own family to make a heterosexual marriage. Both seem to believe their marriage is doomed from the start, yet neither see any alternatives. The novel retells the events leading to these bookending frames in which a heterosexual marriage marks a definitive end and beginning. The story, or at least a pretend heterosexual marriage, uh, the story following this prologue begins with an address to the reader titled, Your Journey, Part One which orients the view as you imagine yourself a tourist. Like Kincaid's tourist, if more gently, you are told what you might or might not have noticed. You are commanded to raise your eyes, look behind you, and finally you are told you'll need to move right into the homes, into the private and public dealings, into the minds even of some of its citizens. Your journey, part two, takes the reader into the city's suburbs and class divisions, and part three, deeper into the heart of the country and its plantation history, with its gulf between the cocoa Indian and the sugar Indian. The novel moves toward its concluding sections with your journey home. In this final section, the reference for you begins to blur the initial distinction between the reader and Vivica. What the novel reveals is the society's domestic tyrannies and hypocrisies described as a clockwork life and linked to the oppression of communal family living. The same thing that Vivica finds in Naipaul's House for Mr. Biswas. Anik articulates what most of the characters feel, complaining 
is like a prison living in this country. Parts two and three look at the class divisions that make the country unsafe for the privileged while continuing to elaborate the homophobia that marks country and city, rich and poor. Annex French father sees the history of Nyanza State as a history of the island and part of the story of the rise and decline of empire. But that larger perspective is denied to those born in this small place. Nyan expresses an Ipaulian sensibility, telling Viveka, we are not properly Indian and don't know how to be Trinidadian. We are nothing. Viveka learns through the course of the novel that she had to leave. Your journey home, seemingly addressed to the reader, also speaks for her. And the text says, in any case, as the saying goes, wherever you go, there you are. There you are. So is this a version of I am where I think? The ambiguity of the you at this point implicates the reader and Vivica's story in a different way to that affected by Kincaid's address in a small place. As a mode of address, it claims the situatedness that involves us all, but involves us all differentially. So in telling a generational story of the societal refusal to make space for same-sex desire, for Anik, Valmiki, Trevor, and Vivica, Valmiki's daughter employs realism to tell a story that could also be described as experimental in its broaching of alternative epistemologies, its exposure of the subtleties of epistemic violence within this culture, and its experimentation with queer temporalities. It makes me think that the issue in assessing literary experimentation is perhaps less the author's choice between conventional realism and its many others, but rather what is done by readers with the generic choices made. Uh, and this takes me to the provisional conclusion that I think the challenge of reading across borders involves that search for realms of value that are neither scientistic nor moralistic, that are created in recognition of I am where I think, recognizing that generates variable and shifting forms of writing that will be experimental to the extent they encourage in readers an ethical engagement with the shifting conditions of everyday life in all their complexity. So thank you for listening.